the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, Sri Lanka's foreign exchange revenue from tourism surpasses $2 billion in the first eight months of this year with a 66.1% jump from the same period compared to last year. Exponential increase observed in the number of vessels arriving at Hambantote International Port for repairs and layups this year, marking a significant boost in its operational growth. The Colombo Stock Exchange starts the week poorly with ongoing negative trends as both indices closed today's session down, suggesting a cautious outlook ahead. And Canada's alimentation couch tart says it is open to confidential talks with Japan's 7NI Holdings about its $38.5 billion takeover offer. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Nadi Balasuria. The central bank said, quoting tourism promotion authorities, that the country's foreign exchange revenue from tourism rose to $2.17 billion in the first eight months of this year, with a 66.1% jump from the same period last year, while the arrivals also gained 50.7%. Sri Lanka's tourism arrivals rose to more than 1.36 million visitors in the first eight months of 2024. August arrivals were up 20.7% to 164,609 compared to the same month a year earlier. Tourism accounted for nearly 5% of Sri Lanka's economy when the sector was at its peak in 2018. Since then, it has been hit by violent Easter Sunday suicide attacks in 2019 and the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, followed by an unprecedented economic crisis. Sri Lanka expects 2.3 million tourist arrivals this year with an ambitious $5 billion revenue for the whole year. Tourism earnings in August were estimated at $282.1 million, US dollars, up from $210.5 million US dollars in the same month a year ago. The tourism earnings figure is estimated from a survey conducted by the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority. Sri Lanka's imports and the merchandise trade deficit have gradually picked up as tourism earnings came in and people in the sector spent the wages and other earnings. There has been an exponential increase in the number of vessels arriving at Hambantote International Port for repairs and layups this year, marking a significant boost in its operational growth. From January to August this year, the port hosted 23 vessels for these services, which is a remarkable 53% increase compared to the 15 vessels during the same period last year. Two vessels arrived last month alone, while a third, which had a seven-month layup at the port, concluded its repairs in the same month. This surge underscores the port's growing reputation as a key hub for maritime repairs and maintenance. Charaka Rupa Singha, the Deputy General Manager of Marine Services and Fleet Management at HIP, said that this particular market in port services is highly competitive and they already have several operators with different expertise offering their services from Hambantota in International Port. He further stated that with their capacity to accommodate vessels of all sizes for afloat and underwater repairs and the numerous berths they have allocated for this business, sometimes for extended periods, they expect this segment of services to expand further in the coming year. The floating production storage and offloading vessel Sveta Venetia, which spent seven months at the port for an extensive layup, successfully concluded the operation and departed on the 21st of August of this year. The most recent arrival is the bulk carrier Ark and Gabriel, which docked at HIP on the 26th of August for maintenance of its steering gear's hydraulic system. The current increase in vessel activity is a testament to HIP's growing reputation as a key player in the ship repair and layup sector, reinforcing its role as a critical multi-purpose hub in global maritime logistics. <laughs> Industry stakeholders warned that Sri Lanka's tourism industry is at a risk of winter season collapse due to delays in reactivating the electronic travel authorization system. The ongoing visa issuance problems have caused significant setbacks to international visitors. 
Senior representatives of the industry told journalists that they, together with sector stakeholders, will take to the streets if the government does not implement the SLT Mobitel Run ETS system, despite a Supreme Court order issued on the 2nd of August. The Immigration Department is said to temporarily suspend the controversially outsourced VFS Global System and reinstate the previous system with immediate effect. Stakeholders warned that the delays have caused significant impacts to the sector, with tourists now spending an average of two and a half hours to obtain entry visas at the Bandaranaika International Airport. International airlines too have already begun expressing hesitation in boarding passengers bound from Sri Lanka due to doubts over whether tourists will be granted visas upon arrival. Meanwhile, the Joint Apparel Association Forum joined the bandwagon in urging the government to immediately resolve the ongoing challenges related to the issuance of the short-term business visas. The JAAF noted that all official foreign business visitors, including buyers, machinery suppliers and technical service providers, have faced significant hurdles entering Sri Lanka due to the lack of a proper business visa issuance system. While tourist visas are available on arrival, there is currently no facility to issue business visas through this channel. Foreigners arriving for short-term business visits are not eligible for tourist visas, leaving a critical gap in the country's ability to accommodate overseas business visitors. The JAAF pointed out that these visitors are essential to the nation's economic recovery, particularly in sectors like apparel and manufacturing, where international engagement is vital for exports and business expansion. Sri Lanka Customs, a chief government revenue collection department, has said that it brought in 1 trillion rupees so far this year. Director General of Customs Sarat Nonis was quoted saying he was confident that the IMF revenue target of 1,534 billion rupees for this year can be achieved within the next four months of the year. The department's previous highest revenue was 975 billion rupees, which was in last year. Typically, 25% to 30% of total customs revenue comes from car imports, but this figure has dropped below 6% due to restrictions on car imports in both years. The Director General credited the opportunity given to the administrative authority and officials to operate independently without external interference, and the new operational methods and technical processes implemented over the past two years. Years. He added that the department was able to streamline operations through new methods and advanced technical processes. Sri Lanka Customs also opened Internal Affairs Unit to receive and investigate public complaints. Last month, its Chief Financial Officer M. A. Mutakude said that out of 58.6 billion rupees of the department's uncollected revenues, 57.7 billion rupees are related to state agencies. Let's take a short commercial break now. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Not a good start for the Colombo Stock Exchange as the negative trend seems to be persistent at the start of this week as well. Both indices ended today's session with downturns signalling a cautious outlook for the days ahead. To get the summary of today's market performance, we now join with Netni Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you, Nadi. The Colombo Stock Exchange experienced another day of losses as both indices recorded on the negative territory. ASPI registered at 10,663, losing 113 points. Selected banking sector shares and blue chip companies dragged the index down as selected uh, counters namely Commercial Bank, Hat National Bank and Ceylon Tobacco Company. Furthermore, uh, sectors across the market experienced price declines on the back of political uncertainty in the country and the negative sentiment in the market. Turnover was recorded at LKR 1.2 billion, 62.3% higher than the monthly average of LKR 763 million. Richard Peeris and Motor Company recorded an off-board transaction of LKR 102.5 million. The food beverage and tobacco sector contributed 46% of the overall turnover, whilst banking and capital goods sectors jointly contributed 44% to the overall turnover. Foreign investors turned net buyers, recording an inflow of LKR 44.8 million amidst low participation. Thank you. 
what can we expect from the Colombo Bears in the coming days? We turn to Dimantha Matthews for his expert analysis and insights. The market has been on a bit of a downtrend over the uh, past few weeks. Uh, that's primarily because of the political uncertainty uh, that is there and uh, investors are on a mindset of a wait and see mindset uh, over the past couple of weeks and if you take uh, going forward also uh, there's no real change in the mindset even today uh, we saw the market uh, sort of having a bit of a, a decline and so selling pressure is high and uh, we feel that uh, going forward also uh, there will be a, a selling mindset and the lack of buyers in the market is the primary reason for the downtrend and uh, we feel up until the election uh, this uh, sort of uh, negativity among the investors or the wait and see approach uh, among the investors is likely to be present. In addition to that, uh, there is somewhat of a panic selling among uh, some of the selected investors and uh, that trend is also likely to continue. However, uh, you can see uh, slightly higher levels of uh, turnover in on selected days. That is because uh, there are uh, bargain hunters coming in on and off. So over the uh, next few days also you will you may see some amount of uh, bargain hunters also uh, present as well so overall uh, we think uh, there is likely to be a, uh, on a sort of a, a selling or negative uh, mindset however uh, on and off bargain hunters are likely to be present so uh, turnover levels are likely to be uh, volatile and uh, we think uh, most uh, earnings that are uh, delivered by uh, companies is uh, likely to be uh, ignored until this uh, political un uncertainty uh, settles uh, on the 21st of September. Gold prices dipped today as the dollar ticked higher, while investors looked towards this week's U.S. inflation data to gauge how far the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates. Spot gold fell 0.2% to $2,491.11 per ounce, while U.S. gold futures edged 0.2% lower to $2,520.30. The dollar index rose 0.4%, making dollar-priced gold less appealing to holders of other currencies. Bullion, which offers no interest of its own, tends to thrive in a low interest rate environment. Traders see a 75% chance of a 25 basis point cut at the Fed's meeting next week and a 25% chance of a 50 basis point reduction. August U.S. consumer price data on Wednesday could change these expectations. Eyes are also on Thursday's producer price index. Oil futures jumped by about 1% today as a potential hurricane approaching the U.S. Gulf Coast helped oil prices to recover some of the previous week's heavy losses. Brent crude rose 67 cents or 0.94% to $71.73 a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude futures were up 68 cents or 1% at $68.35. Prices of Brent crude had fallen in each of the past six trading sessions, retreating by more than 11% or nearly $9 a barrel to register the lowest closing price since December 2021 on Friday. Analysts said today's rebound was partly in response to a potential hurricane near the U.S. Gulf Coast. The Sri Lankan rupee remains steady against the U.S. dollar today compared to last week, according to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Accordingly, the buying rate of the US dollar is 294 rupees and 59 cents, while the selling rate is 303 rupees and 81 cents. The rupee also remains steady against a basket of foreign currencies. And let's have a look at that rate now.
a short break now corporate updates right after this this is the nightly business report Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Airport and Aviation Services Sri Lanka Private Limited intends to carry out the project to establish an exclusive passenger facilitation service facility at Bandaranaike International Airport, Katunaike, under a public-private partnership. The project will be implemented on a build-on transfer basis with the selected proponent responsible for designing, building, financing, operating, maintaining and transferring it over 30 years. A cabinet-appointed negotiation committee has been tasked with inviting, receiving and evaluating requests for proposals to select the eligible interested party for the contract award. All communications and submissions between the employer and the interested party until the contract is awarded must be directed through the CANC via a specified address. The party to whom the award has been made shall enter into an agreement with the AASL incorporating all terms and conditions. Request for proposals is open to both domestic and international entities. The request for proposals documents in English language can be obtained by paying a non-refundable fee of 500 US dollars or its equivalent in Lankan rupees between 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. local time on all working days until the 15th of October. Alternatively, it can be downloaded from the website www.airport.lk by making an online payment. The RFP document can also be inspected free of charge at the same address or website www.airport.lk. Solidifying its position as a leader in sustainable finance, DFCC Bank has emerged as the first institution in Sri Lanka to issue a senior-rated, unsecured, redeemable green bond. This landmark move underscores its commitment to fostering environmental stewardship and promoting renewable energy. Subject to receiving approval, this historic bond issue will soon be made via an initial public offering and listed on the Colombo Stock Exchange. The initial public offering of DFCC Bank's green bonds is expected to raise up to 2.5 billion rupees with an initial issue of 2 billion rupees and an option to raise an additional 500 million rupees in the event of oversubscription. The price per bond is set at 100 rupees and the minimum subscription requirement is set at 100 bonds or 10,000 rupees or multiple thereof. The bonds are classed as Type A with a tenure of 3 years and a fixed interest rate of 12% per annum with annual interest payouts and a bullet capital repayment at the end of the bond's tenure. DFCC Bank's pioneering role in issuing green bonds is a natural extension of its long-standing dedication to sustainability dating back to the 1990s when it financed Sri Lanka's first private sector grid-connected mini hydro power project. Rosso is proud to announce the launch of the country's largest tile, which is an impressive 1 meter into 1 meter premium tile under its eternal range. This launch marks a significant milestone in the local tile industry, further solidifying Rosso's position as the leading innovator in design and technology. For decades, Rossell has been at the forefront of introducing the finest global designs and cutting-edge technology to Sri Lanka, redefining luxury living for homeowners and design professionals alike. The new Eternal range, inspired by some of the world's most exquisite designs, exemplifies Rossell's dedication to creating beautiful living spaces. The Eternal collection showcases a diverse array of designs from the timeless elegance of Eternal Italian white marble, travertine, stone and the enduring heritage of cement and concrete and the minimalist allure of neutral hues. The anticipated Asia-Pacific Retailers Conference and Exhibition 2024 commenced on the 4th of September at the Shangri-La Hotel Colombo with a riveting welcome ceremony that brought together top leaders and innovators in the retail industry. 
organized by the Sri Lanka Retailers Association in collaboration with the Federation of Asia Pacific Retailers Associations, the event featured a knowledge forum, exhibition and B2B network sessions, continuing on the 5th and 6th of September at the BMICH. Under the theme Redefining Retail in APAC from Transactions to Transformation, the conference explored how the retail landscape is evolving from simple transactions to a transformative force impacting society, culture and the economy. With over 350 foreign delegates in attendance, the event captured the essence of a paradigm shift in retail, emphasizing how the industry can catalyze positive change. Participants discussed and examined case studies demonstrating how retail can drive community development, inclusivity and sustainability. The sessions focused on innovative strategies showcasing retail's potential to create lasting positive impacts on both business success and societal well-being. Let's take a short commercial break. Global updates coming on the other side. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Asian equities slumped at the start of the new week, weighed down by losses in technology stocks on concerns over US economic growth. Japan's Nikkei 225 stock average slid more than 3% before trimming its loss as the yen part last week's sharp gain. Chinese shares declined as weak producer and consumer price data Monday pointed to continued deflationary pressures. The country's stocks have seen a string of downgrades recently as weak economic data raised doubts over its 5% GDP growth target for 2024. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index dropped 1.8%, hitting a three week low, led by declines in Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung Electronics. Canada's alimentation couch tard said it was willing to engage in confidential discussions with Japanese retail giant 7i Holdings on its $38.5 billion takeover offer as it remains keen on pursuing a buyout. Retailer Alimentation Couchetard isn't giving up on its bid to take over Japan's 7i, owner of the 7-Eleven convenience store chain. The Canadian firm said Sunday it remained keen on pursuing a buyout and wanted confidential talks. Seven and I has so far rejected the $38.5 billion offer. It says the deal is not in the best interest of shareholders and would run foul of antitrust watchdogs. Couchetard, which owns the Circle K brand, says it could address those worries by divesting some assets. It said it was confident of arranging finance for the bid, which would be the largest ever foreign takeover of a Japanese company. It would also be the biggest all-cash offer for any firm since Elon Musk bought Twitter for just over $40 billion in 2022. By Monday lunchtime, 7&I stock was up over 2%. That put it above the $14.86 per share offered by Kushtard. The Japanese company has said even a significantly bigger offer wouldn't convince it. Seven and I is much larger than Kushtard in terms of sales, stores and employees. Yet its shares have underperformed for years, amid criticism of its structure and corporate culture. Kushtard, meanwhile, is valued much more highly, at around $52 billion. Now a takeover could massively expand its global reach and economies of scale. But one analyst told it would be hard to do the acquisition at a bargain price, with many investors aware of Seven and I's real potential value. With that, we mark the first bulletin of the nightly business report for this week. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest business and economic updates. Until then, I'm Nadi Balasuria. Thank you for watching and have a good night.